السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله إن شاء الله I want to continue what I was talking about last week about the saying of Ibrahim ibn Adham who's one of the famous early salaf who's mentioned in many of the books especially the books of Zuhud and he was in Al-Basra in Al-Iraq and some of the people of Basra came and they asked him because he was known to be a righteous man so they asked him they said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says if you call on me I'll answer you and they said but we call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we don't see the results we don't see our prayers being answered so he said because your hearts are dead because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call the one who's alive just like he calls Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he calls you to what will bring you to life so if you answer that call then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your call so he says that the reasons are these ten things and the first one he said عرفتم الله فلم تؤدوا حقه you knew Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you didn't uh, fulfill his right so Allah has حقوق Allah has rights, like now people talk about human rights. There's also divine rights. There's people expect to be respected, they expect dignity, they feel it's a right. If you go out there and you abuse somebody, they feel like you're infringing on their rights. But who gave them those rights? That's the question. Because if this was all just randomness, and this was all just a random event, the universe, there's no real meaning behind the universe, it's just a random event then that means really that there's no purpose or meaning and therefore there's no substantiation for rights because I can say I don't like you and I can shoot you if I don't like you or I, I like your car I want to take your car because property has a right but but what is it is it the right of the state well somebody can say I'm an outlaw I want to live outside of the state I don't have any position with the state so rights people claim rights but what are rights based on I mean that's the question. If rights are based on coercive power, then it's only might makes right. So if the state says, I'm right because I can put you in jail, or I can do whatever I want to you, then that's why we're obeying the law. But if there's something above that, if there's a divine right, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تقربوا الزنا Don't go near to fornication. Don't even go near it. He doesn't say in other verses, noon, but in this verse he says, don't even go near it. إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَ وَسَأَ sabila. It's a foul thing and it leads down a foul path. So that's an injunction from Allah. لا تقربوا الزنا فعل أمر يدلو على الوجوب It's a command, imperative mode, and it indicates that it's a command from Allah. So Allah says, don't fornicate. That's His right, that you do not transgress that boundary. وَمَنْ تَعَدَّ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمَ الظَّالِمُونَ If you go past a had, a limit that Allah has put, then you've transgressed the boundary. You've done something that Allah has prohibited you from doing. So if, if those people who accept those rights, they have to recognize not only do they have rights, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself has rights. And one of His rights is that He's worshipped. And that nothing's associated with Him. One of His rights is that He is the musharra'. He is the one that makes injunctions. What doesn't mean that humans can't make laws if they're for the benefit. It's called maslaha mursala. When something is not in the sharia, but there's a benefit from it, then humans can make those laws. And also the ulama say, even in a country that has unjust laws, you're still dictated to obey the laws because it's irtikaba khafad dararain. It's taking the lesser of two evils. So these things are understood. But the point is, is that Allah is the one who commands and he prohibits that is Allah's place and no one else's and the Prophet ﷺ is called Shari'un or Musharri'un Majazan metaphorically because he speaks in the name of Allah he speaks in the name of Allah no one else can do that even the Mufti can't do that he can only tell you his opinion and say Wallahu A'lam that's why a fatwa is non-binding it's a non-binding legal position because we don't know if that's the hukum of Allah or not it's a human attempt at arriving at the hukum of Allah. And that's an important distinction. So Allah has rights. If you don't fulfill those rights, especially after you say you know Him, 
then you have failed to live up to Allah's expectation for you as His creature, something that He created, makhluq. And then He said, Qaratumur Quran, Faram Ta'malubi. You read the Quran and then you don't act according to it. Because the Quran is a book, in essence, it's a book of Tawheed, it's a book of stories, what would be called sacred history, and then it's a book of injunctions, commands and prohibitions. Commands and prohibitions like aqimu salah wa atu zakah. Establish prayer and pay zakah. Those are commands from Allah. So that's in the Quran. But there are many other things in the Quran. For instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْحَيَةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهْوٌ وَزِينَةٌ That this world is la'ib, it's play, it's lahu, it's entertainment, it's zina. وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنُكُمْ and then it's mutual boasting. Each person boasting to the other, I did this, I did that. Uh, I graduated from this university. I got this degree. I made this much amount of money last year. I just bought this, I just bought that. We went to this place for vacation. We did this, we did that. That's all tafakhurun bainukum. Wa takatharun fi amwari wal awlad. And then it's also accumulation of wealth. And then multiplying your children, your progeny, your offspring. This is hayat dunya So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about it? He says, كَمَثِلِ غَيْثًا أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَارَ نَبَاتُهُ It's like a rain that comes down and then it brings the earth to life. So you see it's all green and the kufar, meaning the farmers here, they look at it and they're really impressed. It's beautiful. Just like it was all green last month. If you looked around, it was beautiful to look at your eyes. Now it's all yellow. It's dying. It's all yellow out there. Look at the hills. It's all dead. Allah says that's the likeness of this world. You're young. You're youthful. You have all your vigor. But then, thumma yahiju, and then it begins to. You, you're in your curvilinear mode. You see, the ark has reached its peak, and then it begins to descend. Thumma yahiju, fiyakunu musfarra. And then it becomes dry and yellow. And then it becomes chafe. It's blown away by the wind. And in the next world is a painful punishment for people who didn't take the benefit of this message, of what I'm telling you about the nature of the world. You're not here to be here forever. You're not here to uh, simply enjoy. You're not here just to spend your lives in vain pursuits, in stupidity. Those are the acts of fools. Those are the acts of animals that eat and drink and don't think about tomorrow because they don't have a history. If you have a history, if you know the past, you can understand the present and the future. And that's why humans are so different from other creatures. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. وَمَغْفِرَةٌ But there's also forgiveness. وَمَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانٌ And also there's contentment that Allah is actually pleased. There are people that they're not even forgiven. They're just no hisab at all. Those are the people who come in. So that's the Qur'an telling us that. So who takes those messages? قَرَاتُمُ الْقُرْآنِ فَلَمْ تَعْمِلُوا بِي You read the Qur'an, you don't think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أُرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا And then we cause this book to be inherited by those we have chosen from our servants. Whatever book it was that was passing. But this Qur'an for us, because this is the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we gave them this book. Those we have chosen, that it's a gift from Allah. You've been chosen to receive this gift from Allah. And among them there are oppressors for themselves. They're not oppressing others, they're oppressing themselves. And then there are those who are in between. They're in between. And then there are those who are outstripping in good deeds by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ذَٰلِكَ هُوَ الْفَضْرُ الْكَبِيرُ That is vast bounty. If you want dunya, that's dunya. فَفِي ذَٰلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسَ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ Let people compete in that. That's the real bounty in this world. That's the real bounty. So Allah describes three people among the people of Qur'an. People who oppress themselves, those are the people that don't take heed from the Qur'an. They don't listen to the message. They read it, they say they believe in it, but they're not acting according to it. In the tafsir they say Allah began with that person so that they don't lose hope. Because they're still amongst His ibad. And there's still people that are chosen. 
And then the muqtasid is in the middle. And then sabiqun bil khara'id, bi'idhnillah. And then those who are outstripping, and Allah says about them, by the permission of Allah, so they don't get arrogant. They recognize that it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those people, the Qur'an is there. He said, you're not reading the Qur'an. And then he said, أَدْعِيْتُ مُحُبُّ الرَّسُولُ فَلَمْ تَعْمَلُوا بِسُنَّتِي You claim to love the Prophet. قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتْتَبِعُونِي If you love Allah, then follow me. يُحْبِبْكُمْ Allah. Allah will love you through following me. So following the sunnah of the Prophet and the Prophet said that anyone who loves him will enter Jannah, except the one that refuses. And he says, who's the one that refuses? He said, whoever turns away from my sunnah has refused. Because love, like I said, ta'asid ilaha wa tas'umu hubbuhu. You disobey Allah and you claim to love Allah. This is something amazing. In kana hubbuka sadiqan la ta'atuhu. If you're loved. And then he said, ad'aytum hubb al jannah wa lam ta'amalu li ajliha. You claim to love paradise, and then you don't act according to it. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, أَلَا إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ غَالِيَا أَلَا إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ غَالِيَا أَلَا إِنَّ سِلْعَةَ اللَّهِ غَالِيَةٌ أَلَا إِنَّ هِيَ الْجَنَّةِ Isn't this merchandise that God is selling precious? Isn't it precious, this merchandise that Allah is selling? إِنَّ اللَّهِ اشْتَرَى مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He's purchasing. It's a transaction between you and Allah, but it's expensive. What's the cost? Your life. That's the cost. In Allah shtara minin mu'minin anfusuhum wa amwaluhum. He bought their selves and their wealth. That's the cost. Bi anna lahum al jannah. But against it, they get paradise. And that's why one of the ulama said, if you had to choose an outhouse that goes on forever or a palace that doesn't last, your rational intellect would have to choose the outhouse that goes on forever. So what about giving up an outhouse that doesn't last for a palace that lasts forever? That's what Allah is calling us to. Because this is dunya. In the mansions of God, this is the bathroom. This is the lowest place in the mansions of God. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that Imam Ahmed narrates, he said, جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِمَا يَخْرُجُ مِنِ بْنِ آدَمْ مَثَلًا لِلْدُّنْيَا Allah has made a metaphor for what the son of Adam defecates, is a metaphor for this world. That's the nature of this world. It's, it's just consumption, it's animalism, cannibalism. It's all breaking out and, and repairing and being destroyed, but in the end it goes to destruction. And that's the whole process of digestion. It's all in that metaphor. That's what it is, digestion. You eat, and then there's breaking down and building up. You take from, but in the end, there's nothing that will remain. The bridges won't remain. The buildings won't remain. People won't even know these names. Intel and Microsoft. They won't even know them a thousand years from now if there's even people around here. They'll just be like some Roman, like we read about Roman. There used to be Roman corporations. There were Roman big businessmen. They had offices. They had bureaucracies. The Ottomans had bureaucracies, they were writing contracts, they had deeds, they had courts, they had people arguing, my wealth, he did this, he did that, they had judges sitting, presiding over them, they're all gone. All of them. None of them remain. And now we're here, and then we'll be gone. And there'll be other people, there might, this mosque might be around 50, 100 years from now, none of us will be sitting in here. Except maybe a little child. He'll be an old man then, and there'll be somebody else, maybe. That's where things are going. If people don't take their lives seriously, and recognize that they have an obligation to this religion. That's what this religion is about. It's about preservation. You're given to it, you preserve it, you pass it on. That's the whole point of your life. That's it. Istikhlaf and ibadah. That's why you were created. To prepare the next generation to take over. All your children, they're your replacement. That's all they are. Look at them, they're there to replace you. Just like you replace your fathers, and your fathers replace their fathers, and their fathers replace their fathers, all the way back to Adam. That's all, they're just replacement. You're looking at your replacements. And just like when you're working in a job, and they bring in some young whippersnapper, and they give you to mentor him, what do you think they're doing? They're preparing him to take over your job. And you can either resent it and feel angry, or you can recognize that's the nature of dunya. I'm 50, I'm not 20, I'm not 25, I'm not just out of college with all the latest information, raring and ready to go. 
That's what they want, young energy. Well, that's what Islam wants as well. Islam wants young energy. It wants new energy. The youth have to come in and take over the job of the older people. And that's mentoring. So he said, you claim you love paradise, you don't act for paradise. You claim to fear the fire, but you don't flee from it. And this is where humans are very strange. You see, because if you take an animal, any animal out there, and if they see a fire, they run the other way. If you ever saw a film called Bambi, I saw this when I was a little kid. I haven't seen it since, but I remember very vividly a scene in there. When all the animals are running, because man has started a fire, they're all running in, in the same direction, away from the fire. That's why they're animals. They have intuition. They know. It's instinct. They're all running away. And there's a point to stop. And the, and the little deer says to the, the mother deer, the doe, why are we running? He said, because man's come into the forest, started a fire. That's what animals do. They run away from the fire, right? The humans, they don't. Let's take a drive up and check that fire out. That's what humans do. They want to go see. It's like my son was in a grocery store and there was a, a, a lady smoking a cigarette. And he looked up. It was probably one of the first time he saw a cigarette. He looked up and he, you could tell he was in shock. And she looked at him and she said, whatever you do, don't ever do this. You see, that's the human condition. It's people acting against their own best knowledge, against their own best interests. And that's why Allah says, In hum kal an'am. They're like animals. Bel hum adal. They're even more astray because animals will not act against their own best interests. Animals will not do that. If they sense danger, they will flee the other way. But humans know. We eat too much. We drink too much. We sleep too much. We waste too much time. We prefer things that are fleeting for things that are permanent. We prefer our appetites and delights over difficulties that have much greater rewards. That's stupidity. That's all it is. That's, you have to call it what it is. You call a spade a spade. You have to call it what it is. It is stupidity. And that is the question. Are you an aqil or not? Because afara ta'qilun. Allah asked that question in the Quran. Don't you use your intellect. Afara ta'qilun. It's right there in the Quran. Aren't you using your intellects? Just think about it. Think about what you're doing with your lives. And whether they're useful or not. And then he said, You claim that shaitan is your friend, or your enemy, and then you do what he says. Right? And shaitan is a, a trickster. And and he swore an oath to Adam and Eve. I am giving you sincere counsel. Can't I indicate to you how to gain eternity and a dominion that never perishes? He swore an oath. He led them astray, deluding them. That's what shaitan does. And you can't say you haven't been warned. Allah warned us in the Quran. He told us who he was. He gave us all his characteristics, his descriptions. He even told us what he says in secret. Everything, we know everything about shaitan. The only thing about shaitan that is our disadvantage is we can't see him and he can see us. You can't see him, but he can see you. So that, that's the disadvantage. Now shaitan swears an oath. Right? لَا أُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ بِعِزَّتِكَ he swears an oath by the izza of God, by the exalted nature of God. He swears an oath. I will lead them all astray. Illa ibadika minhum al mukhlasin, except those who have sincerity among them. I don't. I don't have control over them. And that's why Shaitan, when they all go into hell, Shaitan says to them, "Waqad Shaitanu lama qudi al amru." When the affair is over, fariqun fil jannah wa fariqun fil sa'ir. Right? That's it. A group in hell and a group in paradise. قَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدُكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ وَوَعَدُكُمْ فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ Allah promised you a true promise and I promised you a false promise. That's what he tells you. It's just he has a khutbah in hell. And all the denizens of hell are there present for that khutbah. And that's what he says to him. 
Allah promised you the truth. Everything that was in the Quran, it was true. Everything was in the Torah, it was true. Everything was in the Gospel, it was true. All those prophets spoke the truth. He gets all of them, that harvest of humanity. The whole lot that disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are in there. And that's what he says to them. He says, I, Allah promised you and I promised you. You believe me. You didn't believe Allah. I betrayed you. And then he says, مَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ I had no authority over you. إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي The only thing I could do was invite you to sin. And you responded. I could invite you to be miserly. I could make you fear. Just like if you go to a family planner, you know what he's going to say to you? He's going to say, what are you going to do when you die? What are you going to do? You know, did you know that 6% of people will have a major illness? Did you know that? Before they're 50, you're 45. That's only five years left. You could be in, that's what they do. That's shaitan's game, fear. Put aside, put aside, you know, white penny for a black day. Put aside, that's shaitan. That's what he does. Don't blame me, just blame yourselves. I can't save you now. And you can't save me. That's what Shaitan says to everybody.